Episode 46. Personally, Harry was sure that Crookshanks had eaten scabbers, and when he tried to point out to Hermione that the evidence all pointed that way, she lost her temper with Harry, too. Okay, side with Ron. I knew you would, she said shrilly. First the firebolt, now scabbers. Everything's my fault, isn't it? Just leave me alone, Harry. I've got a lot of work to do. Ron had taken the loss of his rat very hard indeed. Come on, Ron. You were always saying how boring Scabbers was, said Fred, bracingly. And he's been off colour for ages. He was wasting away. It was probably better for him to snuff it quickly. One swallow. He probably didn't feel a thing. Fred said Ginny indignantly. All he did was eat and sleep, Ron. You said it yourself, said George. He bet Goyle for us once, Ron said miserably. Remember, Harry? Yeah, that's true, said Harry. His finest hour, said Fred, unable to keep a straight face. Let the scar on Goyle's finger stand as a lasting tribute to his memory. Ah, come on, Ron. Get yourself down to Hogsmeade and buy a new rat. What's the point of moaning? In a last-ditch attempt to cheer Ron up, Harry persuaded him to come along to the Gryffindor team's final practice before the Ravenclaw match so that he could have a ride on the firebolt after they'd finished. This did seem to take Ron's mind off Scabbers for a moment. Great. Can I try to shoot a few goals on it? So they set off for the Quidditch field together. Madame Hooch, who was still overseeing Gryffindor practices to keep an eye on Harry, was just as impressed with the firebolt as everyone else had been. She took it in her hands before takeoff and gave them the benefit of her professional opinion. Ooh, look at the balance on it. If the Nimbus series has a fault, it's a slight list to the tail end. You often find they develop a drag after a few years. They've updated the handle, too. A bit slimmer than the clean sweeps. (laughs) Remind me of the old silver arrows. A pity they've stopped making them. I learned to fly on one, and a very fine old broom it was, too. She continued in this vein for some time, until Wood said, Uh, Madam Hooch... Is it okay if Harry has the firebolt back? We need to practice. Oh, right. Here you are then, Potter, said Madame Hooch. I'll sit over here with Weasley. She and Ron left the field to sit in the stadium, and the Gryffindor team gathered around Wood for his final instructions for tomorrow's match. Harry, I've just found out who Ravenclaw is playing as seeker. It's Cho Chang. She's a fourth year and she's pretty good. I really hoped she wouldn't be fit. She's had some problems with injuries. Wood scowled his displeasure that Cho Chang had made a full recovery, then said, on the other hand, she rides a Comet 260, which is going to look like a joke next to the firebolt. He gave Harry's broom a look of fervent admiration, then said, okay, everyone, let's go. And at long last, Harry mounted his firebolt and kicked off from the ground. It was better than he'd ever dreamed. The firebolt turned with the lightest touch. It seemed to obey his thoughts rather than his grip. It sped across the field at such speed that the stadium turned into a green and gray blur. Harry turned it so sharply that Alicia Spinner screamed. Then he went into a perfectly controlled dive, brushing the grassy field with his toes before rising 30, 40, 50 feet into the air again. Harry, I'm letting the snitch out, Wood called. Harry turned and raced a bludger toward the goalposts. He outstripped it easily saw the snitch dart out from behind Wood and within ten seconds had caught it tightly in his hand. The team cheered madly. Harry let the snitch go again, gave it a minute's head start, then tore after it, weaving in and out of the others. He spotted it lurking near Katie Bell's knee, looped her easily and caught it again. It was the best 
practice ever. The team, inspired by the presence of the firebolt in their midst, performed their best moves faultlessly, and by the time they hit the ground again, Wood didn't have a single criticism to make, which, as George Weasley pointed out, was a first. I can't see what's going to stop us tomorrow, said Wood. Not unless... Harry, you've sorted out your Dementor problem, haven't you? Yeah, said Harry, thinking of his feeble Patronus and wishing it were stronger. The Dementors won't turn up again, Oliver. Dumbledore'd go ballistic, said Fred, confidently. Well, let's hope not, said Wood. Anyway, good work, everyone. Let's get back up to the tower. Turn in early. I'm staying out for a bit. Ron wants a go on the firebolt, Harry told Wood. And while the rest of the team headed off to the locker rooms, Harry strode over to Ron, who vaulted the barrier to the stands to come and meet him. Madame Hooch had fallen asleep in her seat. Here you go, said Harry, handing Ron the firebolt. Ron, an expression of ecstasy on his face, mounted the broom and zoomed off into the gathering darkness while Harry walked around the edge of the field, watching him. Night had fallen before Madame Hooch awoke with a start, told Harry and Ron off for not waking her, and insisted that they go back to the castle. Harry shouldered the firebolt, and he and Ron walked out of the shadowy stadium, discussing the firebolt's superbly smooth action, its phenomenal acceleration, and its pinpoint turning. They were halfway toward the castle when Harry, glancing to his left, saw something that made his heart turn over, a pair of eyes gleaming out of the darkness. Harry stopped dead, his heart banging against his ribs. "'What's the matter?' said Ron. Harry pointed. Ron pulled out his wand and muttered, Lumos. A beam of light fell across the grass, hit the bottom of a tree and illuminated its branches. There, crouching among the budding leaves, was Crookshanks. Get out of here, Ron roared, and he stooped down and seized a stone laying on the grass. But before he could do anything else, Crookshanks had vanished with one swish of his long ginger tail. Say... Ron was furious, chucking the stone down again. She's still letting him wander about wherever he wants. Probably washing down scabbers with a couple of birds now. Harry didn't say anything. He took a deep breath as relief seeped through him. He had been sure for a moment that those eyes had belonged to the Grimm. They set off for the castle once more. Slightly ashamed of his moment of panic, Harry didn't say anything to Ron. Nor did he look left or right until they had reached the well-lit entrance hall. Harry went down to breakfast the next morning with the rest of the boys in his dormitory, all of whom seemed to think the firebolt deserved a sort of guard of honor. As Harry entered the great hall, heads turned in the direction of the firebolt, and there was a good deal of excited muttering. Harry saw with enormous satisfaction that the Slytherin team were all looking thunderstruck. Oh, did you say his face? said Ron gleefully, looking back at Malfoy. He can't believe it. This is brilliant. Wood, too, was basking in the reflected glory of the firebolt. Put it here, Harry, he said laying the broom in the middle of the table and carefully turning it so that its name faced upward. People from the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff tables were soon coming over to look. Cedric Diggory came over to congratulate Harry on having acquired such a superb replacement for his nimbus. And Percy's Ravenclaw girlfriend, Penelope Clearwater, asked if she could actually hold the firebolt. No, no, Penny, no sabotage, said Percy heartily as she examined the firebolt closely. Penelope and I have got a bet on, he told the team. Ten galleons on the outcome of the match. Penelope put the firebolt down again, thanked Harry, and went back to her table. Harry, make sure you win, said Percy in an urgent whisper. I haven't got ten galleons. Yes, I'm coming, Penny, 
and he bustled off to join her in a piece of toast.